appreciated. Thank you, Lois. <coughs> also to Bree Papen and Kirby Stokes. Thank you. And Lisa Schwartz from CU. They put this together and it's most appreciated. Thank you. Lisa. Oh, I think Bree's going I mean, Kirby. <laughs>
and with the collaborative partners of the Trinidad Writers Group. So we thank you very much. Um, uh, we thoroughly enjoyed the last one. Thank you. Um, I think I can probably share everyone's emotion that um, being privileged to be in Temple Aaron too and being in this environment is um, quite regal. And to be able to experience Professor Goodman's uh, talk tonight is quite a privilege for us in Trinidad. Um, so it's, it's very sweet for me to be able to introduce her. Um, I had a very quick meet and greet with her and her partner on the sidewalk this afternoon, and um, I was immediately taken with you. So I thank you very much for making you part of your evening. With a PhD from Harvard and a Juris Doctor from Stanford, Professor Goodman is Director of the Program in Jewish Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder and Professor in the Jewish Studies and English Departments. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards and is the author of three books, Shifting the Blame, Literature, Law, and the Theory of Accidents, Banished, Common Law, and the Rhetoric of Social Exclusion, and The Puritan Cosmopolis, The Law of Nations and Early American Imagination, which is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Her next book, which is in progress, is on the very subject she will be talking about tonight, the quirky and powerful Shabtai Zvi, the false Jewish Messiah. Professor Goodman first became obsessed with Shabtai Zvi while she was living in Istanbul on a Fulbright Fellowship, where she met several of Shabtai Zvi's followers, known as the Domne, Domne. Domne and where she first became aware of the strange connections between Shabtai Zvi and the 17th century Puritans living in England. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Nan Good. And uh, the person who was 
in charge of the Ottoman Empire at the time, in the middle of the 17th century, was uh, Mehmet IV. Mehmet was the sultan. Um, he enjoyed hunting more than uh, more than governing, so he was um, he was rather hedonistic, uh, and that was a very good thing as it turned out for this guy. Shatai Svi. So Shatai Svi, uh, this is a Dutch engraving. Most of the engravings of Shatai Svi were Dutch. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Shatai Svi before this? A handful, uh, not even, right? Not a household name, but boy, boy was he ever. He was a, a, a totally, he was the most famous um, of, of Jewish, false Jewish messiahs of his day, uh, and he drew thousands of Jews from all over Europe to his side. People came from the Netherlands, from Poland, from Germany, from Italy, uh, from Egypt, from Syria, from, and these were, the, a lot of those places were within the Ottoman Empire, but a lot, as uh, you well may imagine, were not. Um, tremendously successful, in fact, the most successful uh, false Jewish messiah, so of whom there have been many, right? So um, people have been claiming to be uh, the Jewish Messiah for quite some time because, as, uh, as you all well know, right, uh, in the Jewish tradition, the Messiah is yet to come. And that opens up a huge space for her people to think uh, that, that, they have, that they are the Messiah, right? Because we're all still hanging out and waiting. So you can see from this chart, and this is just a, this is just a few of them, that there were, there were many. Of these, the most famous uh, is Shimon Bar Kar uh, who claimed to be the Messiah, um, and David Rubini, who was a 15th century Messiah. And then you'll note at the bottom of the list, there are actually uh, two people whom many Jews, uh, a minority, a distinct minority, but many Jews actually believe are Messianic. Um, and, and have, have come and whose spirits still exist, right? So, um, but the majority do not, do not believe that. No one, no one had the reputation that Shabtai Svi had. N not one. Who was Shabtai Svi? So, uh, Shabtai Svi was uh, born in Smyrna. It's a town, uh, it's now called Izmir, um, uh, in southern, the southern part of Turkey, it's south of Istanbul. And uh, he, he studied in yeshiva. He was, uh, he was very learned in, uh, in matters that, that were Jewish. Um, and he was fascinated by the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah. So the Kabbalah uh, is a series of texts that most people believe were written in the Middle Ages in France, southern France, Provençal, uh, Italy, Spain, right? But that, again, uh, there's always a divide uh, on these issues that many believe were actually of, of ancient origin. And the Kabbalah uh, is a mystical, a series of mystical texts, right? Texts that, unlike the Jewish Talmud, uh, which, which explains the laws and the Agadah, the, the moral sayings, of uh, the Hebrew Bible, right? The Kabbalah actually develops a mystical system, a mystical analog to the Hebrew Bible, right? And, and the assumption of the Kabbalah is that there's a secret, that there's a secret to the text, right? That the, that the Hebrew Bible was written in code and that you need mystics to decipher it. So Shabtai Svi was a devotee of the Kabbalah. Uh, his most famous, uh, to date, biographer, although there have been many since, Gershom Sholem, an uh, incredibly famous uh, uh, Jewish study scholar, uh, wrote a, a, a biography of, of Shabtai Svi that's, I don't know, 900 pages. Um, so everything you ever wanted to know about Shabtai Svi and more. Uh, and he, he, without any kind of self-consciousness, deemed him bipolar. Surely there was something going on. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Um, others have said that he was schizophrenic. There have been lots of modern uh, attempts at explaining his behavior, um, but, uh, but he's a very unusual guy, that's, uh, to, to, say, to say the least. Um, he performed many, many miracles uh, and heresies, right? Um, he, he took Judaism and turned it on its head. 
And this was extremely captivating for most people. Right? Uh, I mean, this is in addition to proclaiming himself the Messiah. He, he believed in, uh, in very sort of uh, seemingly heretical uh, things about the Jewish tradition. So, um, and you can see that here's an old engraving of Shabtai Svi, and these are the, the, the ten emanations of God, right? So according, according to the Kabbalah, the God left himself, he left little pieces of him or herself um, in, in various spaces. Uh, and each of these has a name. At the very top is uh, wisdom, and at the very bottom is kingdom, by which is meant government or politics, right? So almost akin to evil. So Chomocha is up here, that's wisdom, and, and a kind of um, governance or uh, statehood is on the bottom. And the others are things like splendor, uh, joy, um, understanding, compassion. So, but here, the engraving is wonderful uh, because it shows an 18th century engraving and it shows Shabtai Svi holding the Sefirot, right? And uh, ostensibly gaining uh, a certain amount of wisdom from the Sefirot that was Kabbalistic and that, that authorized him, in a sense, or so he believed, to, to uh, turn things on, on their head. What did he do? What did he do that was so heretical? Well, for one thing, he pronounced the name of God. So and you'll notice here in Temple Aaron, if you look up above uh, the, the, uh, the covenant and the, um, the velvet covering, you'll see these exact letters. Yud, He, Vov, He. And you'll see them up there as well. And that is the name of God which, according to Jewish tradition, you do not pronounce. You do not pronounce. Shabtai Svi went around pronouncing it all day long. Um, the rabbis in Izmir were not that, were not that happy about this. Uh, they actually excommunicated him. But still he got lots and lots of followers. So what else did he do? He proclaimed that it was uh, a good thing to feast on the fast days. So there are only several, only a, a couple of fast days in the Jewish calendar, <laughs> the Jewish year. Um, one of them is coming up uh, on the, the Day of Atonement, otherwise known as Yom Kippur. And uh, Shabtai Svi ordered his followers and adherents to eat as much as they possibly could. In fact, he held feasts in the synagogue in Izmir. You can only imagine what the rabbis were thinking about this. Uh, and he said, uh, let your bitter sorrows be turned into joy and your fast into festivals, for you shall weep no more. Um, he, he, he spoke of a, uh, of a kind of joyousness uh, and happiness that was actually new to much of the Jewish tradition at the time. And so you can begin to see how he gained these adherents, right? He opened up what was a relatively strict system, and he also appealed to the non-literate uh, among the Jewish population, because the Jewish tradition is based very, very heavily in text. And, uh, and that, of course, uh, closed it off to many people who were not able to read. And so with those, with the help of the Kabbalah, uh, Shabtai Svi, he, he, he made something much more available to people. And so you can begin to see, to see his appeal. And uh, last but not least, he was known for a certain amount of sexual promiscuity. Uh, it, it, the story is, goes, in fact, that he was married three times and never consummated any of the marriages. He actually held a very elaborate wedding ceremony uh, in which he was married to the Torah, which sits, which sits behind uh, this curtain. Right? The, holiest, the holiest of holies, the first five books 
of the Hebrew Bible, written in hand on manuscript and rolled, uh, rolled up and read in the synagogue. And so he staged a very elaborate wedding in which he actually married the Torah. And the Torah is often referred to as a bride. Um, but he, he, he did, in fact, whether he consummated his, his actual human marriages or not, he did, in fact, promote a certain kind of sexual promiscuity, although not, not nearly as much as one of his most famous, his, his, his absolutely most famous follower, Jacob Frank, who was a, a self-proclaimed Sabbatean. Uh, who lived in uh, Poland and Austria in the 18th century. And uh, Frank or, is known for, um, for, his, for, for promoting orgies. Um, and that accusation actually has been leveled against many of the Sabbatean uh, followers who still live in Turkey. Uh, and there are many in this country as well, by the way. This is, this is still going on. Um, but uh, as we mentioned in your introduction, the, the followers in Turkey are known as the Donne, and they're very, very secretive, which means, by the way, in Turkish it means the turned, the converted. And it's a very, very secretive sect. And uh, many accusations have been leveled against them about you know, sexual promiscuity. So. But the, the real secret to Shatay Svi's uh, popularity is this guy. Uh, the best front man, the best PR guy in all of human history, Nathan of Gaza. Uh, Nathan of Gaza was a rabbi uh, in Palestine, which was in the Ottoman Empire at the time. And he had met with uh, Shatai Svi and, and encouraged him to proclaim himself the Messiah. So Shatai Svi did that twice. Uh, he did it sometime in his 20s, um, uh, in 1648, around 1648, and then he did it again in 1665. So um, Nathan of Gaza was not, he didn't really come into the picture until about 1665, uh, and once he did, it was a done deal. He traveled far and wide, he was tireless in promoting Shabtai Svi's messianism. And he really, truly believed in it, from all that we can tell. Right? Um, and so, uh, as the story goes, and we have real proof of this, Shabtai Svi was proclaimed the Jewish Messiah in December of 1665. And again, let me just, I, I cannot emphasize enough how many Jews were flocking to his side leaving their businesses, just, just leaving in a flash, bringing their families with them, and leaving their homes all over Western Europe, all over Western Europe. Denmark, uh, they came from Denmark and Norway. So, um, and here is this wonderful uh, lithograph of Shabtai Svi uh, assuming, assuming the, the throne, right? Um, and this word in Hebrew, Tikkun, it means repair, it means healing. And that is what Shabtai Svi was supposed to do. He was supposed to heal the world. So it's, it's not surprising uh, to hear then that one of the reasons that Shabtai Svi was successful, so we've, we've already talked about the fact that he, he, was, uh, he was an antinomian, right? He was against the law, anti against nomos from the Greek law. Uh, he loosened things up, right? He had a wonderful PR guy. But there had to be some other reason for people to, to really buy into this. And there was. The Jews were miserable. They were miserable. They were in a miserable state. Uh, and they really, really, really wanted a savior. Um, the six, in 1648, the year that Shabtai first proclaimed his met his own messianism was the year in which tens of thousands of Jews had been massacred all over the Ukraine. And uh, the guy who led that massacre was Bogdan Khamenevsky. That's a very famous uh, massacre uh, in 1648. So um, Bogdan Khamenevsky was a Cossack, a leader, uh, and in the Ukraine and Poland, uh, today's Ukraine slash Poland. 
uh, and in order to take uh, possession of the territory that he thought was rightfully his, he slaughtered people, not just Jews, he slaughtered, he slaughtered thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, um, but he really decimated the Jewish community in that area. And uh, there had been massacres before that, and the Jews were, were in a sorry, a sorry state. And so Shabtai Svi really appealed to their imaginations um, as, a, as, as a leader. What happened to Shabtai Svi? He converted to Islam. <laughs> and for those of you who are, uh, who are taking uh, notes um, and listening carefully, uh, you will notice that he, uh, he apostatized, he converted to Islam, on September 16, 1666, a mere nine months after he had proclaimed himself the Messiah. Right? So, nine months in office, uh, and now he converts to, uh, to Islam. And uh, he converts to Islam, that, so that song that we looked at before, uh, Mehmet IV, the guy who used to, used to hunt a lot, and really didn't care much about what was going on in the empire, right? Um, he, 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 studies, he, has, he has had no interest in Shabtai Si for a very long time. Uh, and then all of a sudden he, he hears that this guy is, uh, is, is uh, attracting all these followers and that all these people are leaving their businesses all across the Ottoman Empire. And in Europe as well, but that's not his concern, right? He's worried. Now, the Jews have been living, you might be wondering, what were the Jews doing in the Ottoman Empire, right? They had actually been there from uh, before the Byzantine uh, arrival, right? There were Jews there from the Babylonian captivity, the Romano Jews, right? But then there were there was a huge, fresh influx of Jews into the Ottoman Empire after the Spanish Inquisition. And those Jews, known as the Sephardic Jews from Spain, uh, were Hebrew for Spain, for Spanish. Um, had come to the Ottoman Empire where they were welcomed cautiously uh, by the Sultan at the time, right? In the late 15th through the first part of the, fifth, of the 16th century. And they lived under a system of capitulations. Now the capitulations were these brilliant, brilliant laws. I mean, completely cutting edge laws that uh, the Ottoman Empire, which was, by the way, the center of the universe right, at that time, in the 15th and 16th centuries, um, allowed people to live under, their, under the Sultan's rule right, um, and practice their own uh, religion, uh, live according to their own desires, uh, as long as they pay taxes. So um, these were, uh, now I don't want to paint too rosy a picture here, right? <laughs> um, uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the, the ideal situation, but boy, was it a whole lot better than living in Spain, right? Where you either had to convert to Catholicism or die, or both. <laughs> uh, many of the conversos actually uh, also were, were, were killed because they were found out uh, they were found out to be crypto Jews, right, hidden Jews. So, and and many of you are probably familiar with uh, with the Sephardic uh, Jewish community because it's it's unlike uh, the people who actually founded Temple Aaron, who were German Jews. There was also a large Sephardic community in this part of the world, especially in Mexico and Southern Colorado as well. So, um, okay, so the sun gets wind of Shabtai Svi, right? And what he's worried about is that people are leaving their businesses and, and, they're, and they're causing uh, an economic problem for the Ottoman Empire. So he, he beckons him to court in Constantinople. He says, hey, you need to come here. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to talk to you. There's an audience between the Sultan and Shabtai Svi. And the Sultan says to Shabtai Svi, I understand that you're divine. And Shabtai Svi says, yes, yes I am. Uh, as, as, as is so often the case. And, um, and the Sultan says, okay. He says, okay, if you're divine, uh, uh, I'm gonna have my janissaries, the fiercest, most militant military unit on the planet at the time, right? The janissaries. 
I'm going to have them shoot some arrows at you in your general direction. And if you, if you survive, um, I'll be the first one to convert to Judaism, the Sultan says. And this is all, this is all historically true. I'm not making any of this up. <laughs> um, and uh, and Shantai Si says, and, and if I don't? <laughs> and uh, the Sultan says, well, your only other option is to convert to Islam on the spot, which he did. <laughs> so um, so Shantai Si converts to Islam, uh, and he's, he's given the name Mehmet Effendi. Uh, he puts on the turban. And he's, he's imprisoned, but treated rather well. And um, this is a, a slight digression, but I think a one that's, that's worthwhile. The followers, uh, so most, most of the Jews went home <laughs> with their tail between their legs, right? The Jews who had left their businesses and homes um, to follow Shabtai's feet were very, very disappointed, right? What could be worse? What could be worse? Um, but many of them continued to follow uh, Shabtai's feet, and these are the people uh, who are their descendants, who are still living in Turkey, and some in this country. If you go online and you look for Donme West, that is the group of Donme, of followers, Sabbatean followers, who live in the West to this day. Right? And they, and we don't know much about them, right? They are certainly Muslim on the outside. That's what we. That's one thing we know, which is what happened to Shatay City, right? And we don't know a whole lot else. Although I have visited uh, uh, synagogues, excuse me, mosques in Turkey with Jewish iconography um, on the friezes. So uh, people think those are Donme, Donme places. Uh, the, the biggest concentration of Donme followers was in Salonika, um, which is uh, Thessaloniki now in Greece, was uh, one of the major uh, cities in the Ottoman Empire. So Shantai Si, as I say, was sent to prison. Right? Again, uh, uh, an engraving of Shantai Si, and uh, and he receives he receives visitors in prison. So again, treated uh, not badly at all. And I went to as one of the strangest experiences of my entire life. I went uh, two summers ago to a conference on Shantai Si in Ulsan in Montenegro. Uh, I looked up where Montenegro was on the map, but then I got there, and uh, this is where, it's one of the photographs I took, this is the tower where Shabtesky spent his last 10 years. It's called the Baltic Tower, and it's in the town of Olsen. And in Olsen, um, it, Olsen is one of two places where they think Shabtesky died, was buried. Uh, the other is Berat, in Albania. And, uh, we know for a fact that, that he spent his last 10 years in this tower. Uh, and he would walk, this is actually a wall, and he would walk along the wall singing songs in Hebrew to annoy his um, guards. Um, it's a total, total case. Um, also, also received visitors here, uh, and was also reputed, so this is his view, not too shabby. <laughs> And uh, he is reputed to have said uh, that when he died, uh, he would rise again from between these two, these two rocks uh, in, uh, in, the, in the ocean. So um, reputed to be also buried in, as I say, in Olsen. And um, the, the grave is just, just unbelievably bizarre. The grave is in a private home in Olsen. Um, and it's raised uh, like most uh, uh, Muslim graves. And uh, people come, they believe that the person buried there uh, is, is a healer, so people who are sick often come to visit. Um, the family uh, who lives in Wilson, the Montenegrin family, uh, in whose house this, this uh, coffin lies, denies that this was Shabtai's feet. There's a Canadian branch of the family that was also in Olsen and came to our visit, our, our conference, uh, who told us that they, they genuinely believe that, uh, that the grave is Shatesi's grave and they're perfectly willing to accept that as part of their legacy. The family in Olsen is not so willing because that, of course, would mean that they were Jewish, uh, and which is still not a great thing to be in, in Montenegro to this day. 
So, so people after the apostasy, people were um, uh, people felt horrible, right? And they, they, many of them, as I say, disavowed their Sabbatean loyalties, uh, and they did penance. And so, again, an authentic engraving of people. Actually, you can see they're using, um, uh, they're, they're flagellating themselves, and they're putting uh, uh, hot irons on themselves, apologizing, doing penance for this uh, for this devotion, right? Um, and. <laughs> And there's a wonderful, uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful memoir that exists, it's extant, from a woman who lived in the 17th century in Germany. She was a, a Sabbatean adherent, uh, and her name was Google of Hamun. And uh, she, she left this fabulous, fabulous memoir of her life, of what it was like, she was Jewish, uh, what it was like to be Jewish in this town, uh, in Hamlet, and uh, what she ate for breakfast, you know, very, uh, uh, the kind of thing that historians go nuts over, right? Um, and she made this comment, one of my favorite comments about Shabtai Tzvi, throughout the world, thy servants, servants, and children rent themselves with repentance, prayer, and charity for two, yea, for three years. So she's speaking about how long, how long all these people had believed in Shabtai Tzvi, right? Thy beloved people, Israel, sat in labor, right? waiting, 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 waiting. But there came forth naught but wind. <laughs> and you know where that wind was coming from. So, um, <laughs> one of the reasons that many people uh, still hung on to their belief in Shabtai Sfi after his apostasy was because there was also a theory that uh, that the Jewish Messiah, when he or she came, would have to descend, and this is from the Kabbalah, would have to descend to the very depths of sin and despair and, and, and misery in order to experience that, uh, that, 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 that misery, that suffering, and then experience redemption. So in the Kabbalah, this is referred to as the Klipot. And uh, this, I thought, was just an amazing, this is an artist's, an artist's photographic rendition of the Klipot, right? In the Kabbalah, there is a story that uh, when God created, uh, when, when God was, was in the creating mode, right? The first thing he created was not humans, but vessels. We don't really know what that means. Uh, but obviously, in this artist's rendition, these are really vessels, they're pots, right? And the vessels, he infuses the vessels with his light, with his divine light. And unfortunately, the vessels shatter, right? This is known as the story of the shattered vessels. Um, and so that's what you're looking at here. Uh, and uh, the vessels shatter because they cannot, they can receive. They can receive the light, but they cannot give. They cannot give it back. And so it's too much for them, and they, and they fall apart. Right? And so when God sees the vessels, the shattered vessels, that's when he creates humans. And humans have the unique ability to receive and give. Right? Um, so, so this this theory about uh, about Shabtai Sfi was was uh, was a was a very kind of popular one, and often led many of the so-called Bermeg <coughs> to remain uh, to believe in him, uh, even after his death, by the way. And he died about ten years after his apostasy. So. Okay, now we're now 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 you know we're, we're moving we're moving in a very very different direction. So. But it's a meanwhile. It's not before, and it's not after. You guys know these timelines of history? This was one of my you know, greatest epiphanies as a graduate student. It took me until graduate school to, find, to realize how wonderful these were. Right? Um, there were only a few of them when I was in graduate school. There are lots of them now. They are among the most spectacular books, I think, in the world. I would recommend that you all get one for a period that you're interested in. Put it in the bathroom. And, uh, and, and, and you'll, you'll learn a huge amount. Right? So these timelines, and it's, it's really changed the way I think about the world completely. Right? What these timelines do in a very concise way is tell you what's going on uh, you know, in the middle of the 17th century in one part of the world, 
and then you just you follow the you follow the chart out and you see what was going on in a completely different part of the world. And it is truly mind-blowing, right? We're not really usually taught to think that way. Uh, but it's coming, it's 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 a much more of a, a common way of teaching, and I certainly teach that way all the time. So the book that I'm writing uh, is based on this bizarre connection between what was going on in the Ottoman Empire with Chateau uh and what was going on in New England. And the key, the connection here, is between the messianism on the one hand and millennialism on the other, right? So while the Jews were dealing with this, right, the reasons that Shabtai Si was so popular, the Christian world was dealing with, at the very same time, was thinking through the concepts of millennialism, which is essentially the same thing, right? So of course, in the Christian tradition, as you all know, the Messiah had arrived, but there were still stories about the second coming, right? And the millennium, which would mean that Jesus Christ had come to earth and would reign on earth for a thousand years since the millennium, right? So when would that happen? The Christian world was very, very, very involved, very invested in thinking about when it would happen. People were doing very strange things with numbers, right? Going back to the Hebrew Bible, looking at all these prophecies, counting on their fingers and toes, and figuring out all of these, uh, all of these ways of, of thinking about when the millennium would, would arrive, right? So 1666, right? the year that Chuck Tyson apostatizes, big year for the millennium. Big, big, big year. Why? Well, for a variety of reasons, right, that I won't go into necessarily. But you can see the number frenzy popping up, right? Because 666 was uh, the numerical equivalent of some of the Latin words that had been used for the beast uh, in Revelations, right? And then you had a thousand years, presto, right? <laughs> you get, you get, you get the millennium, okay? So, um, so just to, just to reiterate, right? Uh, 66, apocalyptic year, right? The beast, 6666, right? And then there were these phrases. And now here is, here is where Shabtai Sui moves into the, the Puritan world, right? Um, that is the world of the Puritans uh, who had uh, left England first for Holland and then for the New World, the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, in what is now the United States, which is then uh, colonial America, right? Um, because uh, they didn't like what was going on with uh, the Catholic Church post-Reformation and the Anglican Church, right? So they were dissenters, they were religious dissenters, and they leave uh, to come to the New World, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and it's not just the Puritans who are thinking this, by the way, it's Christians all over, and they're looking at phrases uh, like this one from Romans, all Israel will be saved. Uh, these are connected to the millennium, to the ushering in of the millennium. And this, most importantly, the Jews had to return to Palestine before the millennium was ushered in. That's not a quote. <laughs> That's my language. You can tell it's not biblical. But it is from Deuteronomy 30. The Jews had to return to Palestine. So several things had to happen before the millennium was going to be ushered in. Millennium is still to this day. Believe that, right? Okay. So here's a, 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 the actual phrasing from Deuteronomy 30. And it shall come to pass, when all these things will come upon thee, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations. He's talking about the Jews here. The Hebrew Bible, Deuteronomy is talking about the Jews. Whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. So these words became the basis for incredible stories about how the Jews first, A, had to be scattered to the four corners of the world. And there were theories that finally this had happened because there were Jews that had been found in South America. Okay. Um, and the Jews that had been found in South America, they believed was that was the fourth corner, or maybe the third of the fourth corner. There were varying uh, theories about this, right? There were, there were uh, native uh, uh, indigenous peoples who were reciting the Jewish prayer to Shema and had no idea what they were doing. Right? Um, and there were 
many theories that the Jews in the New World, excuse me, that the Indians, the American Indians in the New World were also Jews. And there were, you can't believe how many pamphlets and books were written on that subject, right? Uh, I mean, people really, really believed it, right? Uh, they, they, they were, you know, they talked about the similarity of circumcision procedures. They talked about the similarity of the sequestration of women during menstruation, true of the Native Americans, true of the Jews, right? These were all these things. They had all kinds of theories about how the people of the Native Americans came across the Bering Strait from Israel. And, uh, of course, there were the ten lost tribes of Israel. So all these things are now kind of, you can see them falling into place like a jigsaw puzzle. And this meant a lot to this guy. This, this is one of my guys, right? Um, increased matter. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal man. Uh, his father was Richard, his son was Cotton, and uh, the Mather family ruled New England for 120 years or more. I mean, they were, they were central, right? Um, and uh, in Greece, always a name if you want to bear in mind for your own children or children. <laughs> and they will go over well. Uh, so in Greece, Mather was a minister, right? Um, uh, but he had, he had way more authority than that. He was an extremely powerful figure and very, very involved in both the church and the state that was New England, right? Um, so, why? Why is, why is he interested in this? Well, first of all, um, uh, he's, he's thinking politically, right? So what's going on with Charles II? Charles II is the king of England at this time. During a period, it was called the Restoration, right? So you probably know the general outline, right? It's called the Restoration because Charles I had cut off, right? Oliver Cromwell assumes uh, the rule of England for a period of years. He gets a little too cocky. Um, they don't like him either. Charles II comes back and they restore the crown. Okay, so Charles II, um, very much like Mehmed IV, not, doesn't really care that much about what's going on in New England, just as Mehmed IV didn't care that much about what's going on with Chateau Suite. And then he starts to get a little annoyed because he starts hearing more and more reports about what's going on in New England. He doesn't like it. He thinks that the colonists are getting a little cocky, right? This is, again, middle of the 17th century. And he rips their charter right out of their hands. Right? Now, this is the charter that they came to New England with in 1629. It was given to them in 1629. And it came with them on a, on a ship called the Arabella in 1630. It came with them, right? They weren't supposed to take it, but they took the actual charter. And this is the charter that gave the New England colonies a lot of autonomy to rule themselves, and they liked that a lot, right? So I hope your head is swimming with, how does this, what does this have to do with Chateau City, right? A lot, a lot. <coughs> Increased Matter writes a series of sermons called The Mystery of Israel's Salvation. Um, the things, these these uh, works in those days had extremely long titles. So it's the mystery of Israel's salvation, explained and applied, um, discourse on a discourse, and it goes on and on. Right? So an extremely influential series of sermons uh, called the mystery of Israel's salvation. And who shows up? Who shows up in this? I'm reading along, right? Uh, it's very, very cool. I'm in my pajamas in front of my computer screen. I called off this text from the database that the, the library has, right? And, and who should I see? But shall I see? He's mentioned in Mather's, in Mather's sermon. What does Mather like about Shantai Sfi? Well, we'll see what other people, uh, other Christians, who were part of Mather's world liked about him. So um, no less a prominent figure than Henry Oldenburg, who was the first secretary of the Royal Society in the 17th century in London, said of Shatai Sfi that, uh, that, his, that the Jews took his arrival to be the first coming, because the Jews didn't yet have a Messiah, but the Christians were, were fine with him being the actual embodiment of Christ's second coming. Right. So he was assimilated completely into the millennialist uh, theory. <coughs> right? um, others, other Christians, believed that Shabtai Svi was necessary to bring the Jews to Palestine. You remember the, 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 um, 
the writing from Deuteronomy, right, and from Romans, right? All Israel will be saved, and they will all, all of Israel will return to Palestine before the millennium is ushered in. So even though it's post-apostasy, Increased Matter sticks him right into his sermon uh, and says that he really admires uh, Shabbat Shalom. Um, so he's thinking, as I said earlier, he's thinking about the theory of the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. Here's a um, title page of one of the very popular books about the Indians as Jews. It's called Jews in America, or Probabilities that Americans are of that race, by which when he says Americans, he means the Native Americans. Um, here, is, here is some more of what I was discussing, the, the fact that, uh, that, that the Jews uh, in South America were a good signal that the Jews were going to be, uh, that the Jews were already scattered, right? But it's not, now these are, these are traditional millennialist views on the part of Christians, right? But that's not what Increased Mather likes, and that's what interested me. He likes that these Jews around Shabtai feet are in the Ottoman Empire. And he talks about them being in the Ottoman Empire. Okay? Uh, and why? Why does he like that? Well, he likes it in part because he goes back to a prophecy from Revelation saying that the Jews will come from the East. Well, the Ottoman Empire is in the East. Right? Um, and he's completely absorbed with the Jews in the Ottoman Empire retaking Palestine. And this, of course, was one of the other things that really, really irritated men at the forum, right? He had heard rumors that Shabtai Svi was planning on taking over Jerusalem, right? that he was going to take Jerusalem, which was part of the Ottoman Empire, and take it out of the Ottoman Empire and take it over for the Jews entirely. Right? Increased mind loves this. <laughs> he loves this idea. Um, so what he says, though, is very peculiar. He says that the Jews are going to do this without converting, and that they're going to act from within the Ottoman Empire against the Turks, and that they are a political force on their own. Right? So here's what he says about the Jews not converting in the same, in the same sermon. He says, the providence of God has suffered other nations to have the blood mixed very much. As we know it is with our own nation, there is a mixture of British, Roman, Saxon, Danish, Norman blood, but as for the body of the Jewish nation, it is far otherwise, right? The Jews don't, the Jews, this is increased value. It says the Jews don't convert. They don't convert. Now this was completely wrong, right? It's completely wrong. Um, they were converting all over the place to Christianity, either under duress or voluntarily, all the time. But for matter, the Pharisee is that they are acting as their own agents without conversion, right? And what he really likes, number two, is that they're acting against the Turks from within, from within the Ottoman Empire. The Turkey writes, has the land of Israel in his possession, and we may be sure that they, the Jews, shall never peaceably enjoy the land of the Father again as long as he hath any power to hinder it. Again, from history, right? He says, the Jews have got to go to Palestine and take it back. The Turks are there. The Jews have to take it back. So why do you be thinking, what, what is this Puritan minister? Why is he invested in this, in this story, right? And finally, the third thing he loves is that the salvation of Israel shall be glorious because the Jews will repossess Israel. So this has none of the hallmarks of the traditional millennialist story that the Jews will be saved and convert to Christianity, right? That the Jews, uh, that the Jews will be led by someone other than a Jew, right? This was also something that was familiar to, to Christian millennialists. This is this is a different vision of the Jews entirely, right? As autonomous, strong political force retaking Palestine. So, undoubtedly part of the millennialist, millennialist discourse, but a very unusual picture. Why is increased matter? talking about the Jews this way in the Ottoman Empire. What's he thinking? What is he thinking? Any thoughts about that? Why does he like this story so much? Because he's really mad at the king. He's really mad at the king. He's really mad at Charles II. He's really mad at that, that charter was taken away, right? And he wants to see 
himself, the Puritans, who called themselves the surrogate Israel. Right? The Puritans believed that they were the Jews. I mean, literally. Right? They believed that the Jews in the Hebrew Bible had had their shot and left it. Right? And that the Puritans had taken over the mantle. And he loves the story of the Jews fighting the good fight and retaking Palestine from the Sultan because he wants the Puritans to retake the Massachusetts Bay Colony from the king. Right? So he never says this. He never says this in so many words. But this became an incredibly important story for these people of 5,000 miles away from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and it all started with this guy. This is the most famous etching, Dutch etching, of uh, Shantai Sfi. And uh, that's, <coughs> that's the story of Shantai Sfi and the Puritans. Thank you. Of course. Does are, anyone... there, are there any questions about that very good story? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Slowly, slowly coming out that they're done. 
you know, more and more, you know, a little, a little bit more about Dongbei uh, in Turkey, but, um, but it's, it's really, really, really interesting. So, yeah, it's a great question. Yes? Can you go back to the five point star versus the six point? The, the, Oh, okay. oh, my, my, when, when, uh, when, when Randy, when Randy asked me that, um, my response was, it's not as weird as it probably looks because if these chairs um, are from the late 19th century or even very early 20th, uh, the Mugen Dovid, which is that six-pointed star that we're all familiar with, that we associate with Judaism, was not so. There were six-pointed stars, and the Jews had used them, but they used these just as often. Uh, and the, the book and Dove that six pointed stars, so no one would put a five pointed star in a synagogue today, as Randy was suggesting, right? But it wasn't that way until the first part of the 20th century, really. Uh, it just it just was one of those symbols that people said, oh, okay, this will be our this will be our star now. So it's a, you know some of those um, uh, invented traditions, you know, um, like you think those Scotch tartans are so old, but in fact, you know, they're they're from you know 20 years ago or something. <laughs> yes? Is there any uh, thought within the Dome community that Mustafa Kamal is one? Yes. Yes. Yes, clearly you knew that. <laughs> no, I, I, yes. I, I, yes. I there are there are there are theories that Ataturk uh, was uh, was Jewish uh, because in part uh, and a Dome because in part he grew up in Salonika, uh, and a Turk, the great founder of modern Turkey, the Turkish Republic, right? Um, whose name was uh, Mustafa Kemal. And, uh, and there, there, are, there are theories extant that, uh, that Ataturk Turk is, is Dome, was, was Dome, he's gone now, um, but was Dome, yes, yes. But it's, again, not something you want to say in public, loudly, <laughs> in Turkey. <laughs> Um, yes? Could you spell that word? Dome. D-O, and the O has an umlaut on top of it. N-M-E. Dome. Um, yeah. yeah. Or, or Sabbateans. But they're, they're, in, they're known mostly as Dome, even here. Uh, again, there's that website, <laughs> Dome West, which, which is just a stunning, a stunning website. You'll learn a lot about the Dome. Uh, on that website. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? How far has the increase take this inspiration? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, not that far. Uh, about as far as I just told you. <laughs> about as far as I just told you. Um, he, he uh, but you know, stunning nonetheless, right? I mean, stunning. This guy is writing a sermon from the, from the pulpits of New England in 1669 about shot by speed. Like what? <laughs> um, so uh, it doesn't it doesn't go that far, um, and you know the, he he reverts to the usual platitudes about the Ottomans that they're the Antichrist uh, and that the Jews that they need to be converted to Christianity and saved. Right? It's this really it's this one moment um, in this in this, uh, and you notice that the name of the sermon is the mystery of Israel's salvation, the mystery of Israel's salvation, right? That it's not going to happen the way you think. Uh, that it's going to happen maybe because the Jews are showing this tremendous autonomy. And, and you need to from a historical, from a spiritual, religious point of view, that that's what was going on in increased Madden's mind. But from a more sort of diplomatic, historical, legal point of view, you'll remember how the Jews came to the Ottoman Empire, right, under these capitulations where they were given a huge amount of autonomy, within reason. Um, so, so that's the, hence the connection, I think, for increased money. But that's a terrific question. Um, yeah. OK. Well, I really appreciate you all listening to me.
Goodman and the lecture series for the program of your studies at CU with all these incredible community partners and with all of you who will be able to come and participate. So I just want to give a shout out again to our community partners. We have uh, Randy Rubin and the Rubin family, uh, the Trinidad History Museum, the Trinidad Area Arts Council, and the Corazon de Trinidad Creative District. And uh, well, I'm really, I'm Jewish and this, you know, this is just very, this means a lot to be able to be in this space, I think for all of us. And I'm really saddened by that it's what's happening. I'm also really inspired by what I see happening in Trinidad with the creative district and the space to create and the arts organizations and artists here in town, the kinds of economic development and opportunity that are happening in Trinidad, it's very inspiring. And so before you leave today, we'd love to have you go downstairs and if you go into the back, there, there's some work from some artists that are part of the creative district. Um, Marilyn Hoosler, who's the chair, is one of the artists. And we have photographers Wayne Eakins and I'm trying to think of name, and Jay Obrecht, and Mark Twainer, and Jay Jeremy. No, okay. But Marilyn's here, so you can tell about her art. <laughs> and the creative district and space to create. And we also have an opportunity for you to share any stories you might have about the history of Trinidad, and especially with Temple Erin, with Kirby from the museum. So she has a table set up back there, and that would be excellent if you had some stories to share. And um, really just wanted to thank you all again.